Um, and um, and we're asking, though, that even though everyone is muted, for folks to turn off your sending the calls to voicemail, silence your ringers, et cetera, because if I do unmute people, it's very distracting to hear a lot of the background noise. And please don't put your phones on hold because the music in the background is very annoying and very distracting and doesn't allow us to hear our speakers. So as I mentioned, um, what we're going to do is we're going to have um, three speakers this afternoon, and I'll introduce them in a moment. And for you to be able to ask a question as they finish up, we're going to try to leave us plenty of time for question and answer. You can submit your questions in that Q&A box, or you can raise your hand if you have a little phone uh, next to your name. And to raise your hand, you will see um, underneath all of the names, you will see a little hand button, and that's what you click on to raise your hand so that you can be recognized. So I'm going to move us on to the actual content of the, of the day and the afternoon, uh, which is to hear about the impact model. You're first going to hear from Dr. Jürgen Unitzer, who is a professor and vice chair of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the University of Washington and chief of the psychiatric services at the medical center there. He is internationally recognized as a health services researcher whose work focuses on innovative models of mental health care in general medical settings. But unlike many researchers, he really works to translate that research into effective clinical and public health practice, primarily through the AIM Center, which stands for Advancing Integrated Mental Health Solutions, and the Impact Dissemination Program, which is what you're going to be hearing about. Through that program, they support diverse health care organizations in integrating evidence-based depression treatment into primary care. And for those of us who work in the primary care setting, we know how important it is to be able to address those mental health issues as we try to deal with um, standard medical issues as well. He's published over 175 articles in peer-reviewed medical journals, and he's the recipient of numerous federal and foundation grants and awards for his pioneering research on integrated mental health care. After Jurgen talks about the model and what, what, uh, what it is and how it works, we're going to hear from two folks in the field who are actually using it. The first will be Rita Haverkamp, who is a psychiatric clinical nurse specialist at Kaiser Permanente in the Southern California region and based in San Diego. She's been certified as an advanced practice uh, psychiatric nurse and clinical specialist since 1985. So she's worked at Kaiser for the last 21 years as an outpatient therapist and has previous experience as an inpatient head nurse and a manager for multiple psychiatric uh, units, so she knows her stuff. She was a depression specialist in the original Impact Depression Care Research, and for the last 11 years, she's been providing impact depression care within her role at Kaiser and also um, does PSTPC um, supervision to depression care managers. And last but not least will be Marty Edelman, who's the Mental Health Program Coordinator for the Council of Community Clinics in San Diego, where he manages the Mental Health and Primary Integration Project funded by the County of San Diego. He's also involved in a number of other activities which promote integrated behavior and health care. And he's been working in the San Diego County's public mental health system for the past 21 years as well, uh, where he's served as a clinician, program director, and administrator for both inpatient and outpatient programs. He received his master's degree in clinical psychology from the California School of Professional Psychology in 89 and is a certified psychosocial rehab, uh, rehabilitation practitioner. So with that very fast introduction, I hope it wasn't too fast, I am going to hand the presenter ball over to uh, Dr. Unitzer, who will take it from here. Oh, and I have to unmute you. Sorry. Can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Sorry about that. All right. Very good. Okay. So, hi. This is Jürgen Unitzer. I'm here in Seattle, Washington. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, the California Healthcare Foundation and uh, Sophia Cheng for this nice introduction and for inviting us to share with you the work we've done uh, with the IMPACT program really over the last 10 years. And, and actually, it goes back to 1999 when we did a big research uh, project that really created the evidence base for this model of care. And that research project was uh, funded in part by the California Healthcare Foundation. So it's very nice to be able to come back more than 10 years later and say what we did following up uh, on the original research. Uh, 
All right. Let me see. Uh, so you've heard about uh, who's going to present. This is just the three of us. Uh, and I think any of us would be happy to get in touch with you afterwards if you have questions, if you'd like to email. Uh, and uh, I think we'd be happy to address any questions that we, we raise that we don't get to today. So I'm here at the University of Washington. Uh, I direct a program called the AIMS Center, which stands for Advancing Integrated Mental Health Solution. And it really is a, a group of people, a program that has spent the last 25 years or so thinking about what does mental health look like in a primary care setting and how could you really help uh, sort of leverage what is often limited uh, mental health resources and, and make, uh, our, uh, make, make it better. Uh, make it more effective uh, to really address them in a primary care setting. That's really what we do here. Uh, in part uh, because we're kind of a unique medical school. We're uh, here in the Pacific Northwest uh, where we're the only medical school for a five-state region that covers 25% of the land mass of the continental United States. Not largely urban, but uh, a lot of rural and, and uh, semi-rural areas uh, where you just don't have mental health expertise. And so often primary care is, even if you wanted to go to a specialist, there isn't one to go to, so you're going to go to your primary care uh, provider. And so that makes it a little bit natural for us to be thinking about how do we really help uh, do mental health in that setting. I'm going to say a little bit about uh, integrating mental health and primary care more broadly. Then I'm going to talk about the impact model per se, and I'm going to talk about one uh, example of a program where we've really implemented this pretty system-wide now here in our state, here in Washington, and then I'll turn it over to Rita and to Marty to talk about what they're doing in California. I'm going to start with this uh, cartoon, which is uh, uh, a story that um, comes from a very large study uh, where people surveyed uh, primary care providers in uh, 60 U.S. communities uh, about uh, five or six years ago and asked them about their satisfaction with access to specialists. Uh, and the number one complaint they had uh, with regards to that was that they had no good access to mental health care for their patients. Sixty-six percent of the primary care providers surveyed in this study uh, across the United States said they couldn't get good mental health care for their patients. Uh, so this cartoon here says, we couldn't get a psychiatrist, but perhaps you'd like to talk about your skin. Dr. Perry here is a dermatologist. Um, so this is a huge problem, and it's not just a problem in rural areas. It's also a problem in urban areas uh, where uh, oftentimes our patients don't have good access to mental health care. So now you might say the answer to that is just uh, let's just train many, many, many more mental health specialists and find ways to get them all a specialist. But this next slide here argues a little bit against that. And uh, uh, from those of us who are mental health providers, we see the world through a mental health lens. We think everything is sort of seen through a mental health or substance abuse problem lens. But if you're uh, in a primary care setting, what you realize very quickly is, and you all know this, uh, the patient may have a depression, they may have problem drinking, they may have an anxiety disorder, but they also have a number of other chronic medical problems, they'll have uh, 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 health behaviors that are problematic, uh, and they often have a, a kind of a complex mixture of both chronic physical and emotional pain. Uh, and so I have on this slide in the corner a picture of a chicken and an egg just to kind of sort of make the point that it's not so easy. Uh, a patient who has two or three or four of these things, it becomes very hard, even for a good clinician. I've been doing this for a long time. I think I'm pretty good on depression uh, to tell what's driving what. And if you try to pick it apart and say, for the depression part, you go over here, and for the heart disease part, you go over there, and then you go to another place for your substance abuse problem and someplace else for your health behavior problem, uh, it becomes sort of the opposite of patient-centered care. So for me, the number one argument that I make uh, in favor of trying to address things like depression in primary care is it's patient-centered. Uh, you know, it gives you the best chance to really address all of these things that, that our patients have. Uh, a little bit about depression. Why did we work uh, with depression primarily when we first started this work on integrating mental health care? Uh, it's a very common problem. 10% of primary care patients, uh, and it's more common in patients who have chronic medical illnesses. 
It's the number two cause of disability, according to the World Health Organization now, right after heart disease, and this is worldwide. Uh, it's very expensive, 50 to 10 to 100 percent higher health care costs in patients who have depression alongside other health care problems. And at its worst, it's, it's, I would say, the primary driver behind what are about 30,000 suicides in this country uh, every year. Uh, I'm going pretty quick here because I want to have time for questions towards the end. Uh, there is one slide here that uh, points you to a, a very nice summary article, a meta-analysis done by a British group, uh, a British researcher named Simon Gilbody and his colleagues. They reviewed in 2006 uh, all of the literature on what we call collaborative care for depression in primary care. And at that time, there were 37 randomized controlled trials that showed us that if you do good collaborative care where you have a mental health provider collaborating in primary care with a primary care provider, you're going to be consistently more effective than usual care, which might be either the primary care provider on their own or a primary care provider referring out uh, to a mental health specialist. So there is a very, very robust literature behind this notion of collaborative care for depression. One of those 37 trials was the impact study. It happens to be the biggest one. Uh, you know, this was a very large randomized controlled trial we did starting in 1999 in five healthcare organizations in five states, actually eight organizations in five states, including a couple of sites in California, uh, where we tested this model of collaborative care uh, and uh, 1,800 patients were randomly assigned to either get usual primary care in their clinic or to get the impact model. And I'm going to tell the picture of how it works around uh, the, the story of how it works around this picture you have on the slide here. Uh, so what we said is in every practice, we're going to train a staff member uh, as a depression care manager or a behavioral health care manager who works alongside the primary care provider uh, to support them in managing a caseload of patients with depression. Uh, we're also going to train them how to help provide education and activation and information to patients so that the patients who often don't know that much about depression become better collaborators uh, in their care. And in a sense, what this is, this is a mental health adaptation of Ed Wagner's chronic illness care model. Uh, and we said if we have a practice that has a professional in the practice who can help co-manage these patients, uh, a more activated patient, uh, we have a better chance of the right things happening and patients getting better. On the bottom of the slide, there are a couple of other important things, and we said these practices need a few other things. They need what we call measurement-based care. So every time a client comes in for depression uh, in this project, we give them a PHQ-9, a simple nine-item rating scale, and we say, how bad is this depression? Is it getting any better? And if it's not getting any better, we go to the thing in the middle of the picture. Every one of the teams that we work with has a consulting psychiatrist appointed uh, who is responsible once a week with the care manager to go over all the patients that are being tracked in the clinic and say, those who are not improving on their PHQ-9, I'm going to make some treatment recommendations. I might make recommendations to the doctor about changing medications. I might make medications about a referral to another type of care. I might even say I need to see this patient or one of my colleagues needs to see this patient, a specialist needs to see this patient. Uh, but that's basically how the system works. So in the practice, primary care provider with a care manager and uh, adding a couple of other key elements that we don't do, such as the systematic measurement and then having a consultant available, not just on a PRN basis, but really to review all the cases of patients who are not improving. It's a very different way of using a specialist than a typical refer out, we'll see what happens kind of model. Um, so there, really, to try to summarize what's different in impact here, uh, I'm going to use this slide here. There are sort of two key processes that we introduce. The first one is we said everybody has to have a systematic diagnosis, and every time we see them, we track their outcomes using the PHQ-9, and that will tell us either depression is getting better or not getting better. Uh, and that leads to the second process, and that is the concept of stepped care. So we said if the depression is being treated and it's not improving, uh, they, they could be treated with a medication, it could be treated with psychotherapy. If it's not improving, we have to do what we call stepped care, which is we make a consultation and then we make a change in treatment. And this is something that rarely happens in usual care. Oftentimes what we see is lots and lots of 
months, sometimes years of a patient taking a medication, and they never really gotten much better. Here we would say after eight weeks, if they're not a lot better, we have to do what we call a plan B, change in treatment. And that could be any number of things. And to facilitate these two processes, we introduce two new team members. So the care manager is in the practice, and they're taught to help with some patient education, uh, with doing really close follow-up. So when the patient walks out of the office with a prescription for an antidepressant, they'll reach out to the patient and say, let's make sure you have a chance to fill that. I want to hear if you're having problems early on. Early on, they're really helping with adherence to treatment, with making sure the patient doesn't get lost. Uh, later on, uh, they will be doing the steps care. So if the patient's antidepressant isn't better, they'll bring that back to the attention of the physician, of the consulting psychiatrist. Uh, they may also offer, and we have trained them in some very brief counseling uh, treatments, such as behavioral activation or problem-solving treatment. So they can offer that alongside a medication right there in the primary care physician's office. Uh, and when the patient is better, they do what we call a relapse prevention plan. The psychiatrist, uh, the consulting psychiatrist, uh, really takes responsibility for the whole caseload of patients. They don't see the majority of these patients, but they have to consult on all the ones that are not improving and make recommendations. And in the impact trial, about 10% of the patients were actually seen in person by one of the consulting psychiatrists, usually after a couple of consultations, and then things seem to be stuck. So we would say, okay, we need to have this person seen uh, by one of our consultants. But for the most part, they're just systematically advising on this caseload of patients. This is a picture of the PHQ-9, simple nine-item rating scale. Every single time we have a contact with a client, we use this. It's like blood pressure. Whenever they come into clinic, you take their blood pressure. Uh, same thing uh, with the depression rating here. And we actually do this even on the telephone. We ask people to do this on the telephone with us. A little bit of data. Uh, this is uh, data from the original trial. So remember I told you there were 1,800 participants in this trial. They all had uh, significant uh, clinical depression, and half of them were in a usual care control group, and the other half were in the same clinic with the same doctor, but they had access to the impact care manager and the consulting psychiatrist. Uh, the first thing we looked at is what is the likelihood that patients say my depression care is excellent or very good? So you see at baseline, about 50% of people were saying their depression care was excellent or very good. Uh, and in our usual care group, we see that same 50%. It doesn't change over the next uh, three and then 12 months when we remeasured this. But in our intervention group, the people who had access to uh, the impact depression care management model, uh, that patient satisfaction went up substantially. Uh, so patients liked this kind of care. We also surveyed the providers. I'm not showing you a slide on that, but the providers, we worked with 400 PCPs in some 18 primary care clinics on this. The providers very much like this uh, approach to care. Uh, the most important thing we asked is, does this actually work to get depression better? So what I'm showing you here is a slide that has eight participating healthcare organizations that we tested this model in. Uh, and in every one of these organizations, uh, about 100 patients were in our usual care control group, and about 100 patients were in our uh, impact group, and it was randomly assigned at the patient level. And then we said, what is the likelihood that a depressed patient 12 months later has a 50% or greater improvement in their depression severity? This is a standard that's used in depression research. Uh, if you have a 50% reduction in your depression severity as measured by a standard rating scale, that's considered uh, treatment response or, you know, clinically significant improvement. And we said here, what is the likelihood that that happens? And you can see here uh, in our uh, usual care controls, if you draw a bar through these eight little uh, blue lines here, you would see about 19% of the patients who got usual care had a significant improvement in their depression. If you look at that, uh, if you add the impact care management, same clinics, same doctors, same types of patients, you can more than double that. You get to that to about 50%. So you more than double the likelihood that you get uh, the depression significantly improved. And the, the best thing uh, in my mind is we saw this in every single one of the organizations we did this in. Uh, so it's not like this works well in one type of organizations, but not in others. It was a very, very robust effect. Uh, we also looked at people's physical functioning over time. And what we learned there is uh, the physical functioning uh, in our group of usual care patients gradually declined over the 12 months that we followed patients. And if you look at the impact patients, the patients who've gotten better depression care management, you actually see 
a gradual improvement in their physical functioning. And these are a statistically highly significant differences in physical functioning. So not only do you have better mental health outcomes, you actually get better physical health outcomes if you attend to the depression in a systematic way. And then finally, uh, we looked at uh, the effects of doing this on healthcare costs. Uh, and uh, this is a bit of a complex slide, so I'll spend a minute on it. Uh, we looked over four years. We said uh, people who got this program in the first year, the first 12 months, we would give them the impact program. It cost, on average, $522 uh, to give a patient, an individual patient, uh, the additional treatment. That's the care management, the psychiatric consultant. Uh, and then we looked at all health care costs used by these two groups. Uh, we looked at, uh, you can see here, outpatient mental health pharmacy, outpatient medical, inpatient medical. Uh, and over four years, what you see is uh, if you compare those folks who were in the intervention group, who we spent $522 on the impact model, to those who were in the control group, we spent the $522 on the impact care in year one. And over the next four years, uh, we see lower health care costs in every other category of health care. So at the end of four years, uh, including the $522, it's about uh, about $3,000 cheaper to have been a depressed patient in the impact group than in the usual care control group. So this is not only improving health, it actually reduced total health care costs in the process. So we were very happy when we finished this study, uh, and uh, a number of groups nationally have endorsed this as a sensible way to do mental health care, Institute of Medicine, the President's New Freedom Commission on uh, Mental Health, uh, the National Business Group on Health, all have reviewed this and said this is a sort of a sensible, smart way to try to address depression, which is one of the most common uh, mental problems we see. Uh, we've also done more research, and I can't really go into all of the detail here, but we have taken this model and adapted it for other populations and trialed it in more randomized controlled trial. And this slide actually summarizes uh, about eight or nine studies we've done. So we've tried it with uh, depressed diabetics, uh, with patients who have cancer and depression. Uh, we have tried it uh, with patients who are adolescents who are depressed. We have done a study with depressed arthritis patients. And there is a big study that just published uh, on uh, patients who have heart disease and depression. And in every one of these studies, we basically replicate our earlier finding. Uh, if you do good systematic Primary care-based collaborative care for depression, uh, you get significant improvement in both mental health and, in some cases, the physical health outcome. Um, we've then gone on and said this is, uh, and, and Sophia mentioned this, uh, we were very happy with this study, but, uh, you know, publishing this in a fancy journal doesn't really help patients get better. Uh, so what we've done is we've gone on and with a grant from the Hartford Foundation over the last five years, we've gone about and helped train about 4,000 providers in some 500 clinics around the country and actually doing this model of care. And we've actually gone out and studied some of these replications uh, to have a sense of does this not only work in research, but how does this work, you know, in, in very, very diverse real-world settings. And I'm going to tell you just about one of these programs. Uh, that's a program we have in our state here in Washington. It's called the Mental Health Integration Program. Uh, there's a website for this if you'd like to learn more about it. It's called integratedcare-northwest.org, uh, and I'll just say a little bit about it. This is a program that we do in collaboration with our state here uh, with a health plan called the Community Health Plan of Washington and with a network of community health centers. There's about 120 community health centers in our state that now offer this kind of an integrated collaborative care program. Uh, and it addresses a population uh, that is a safety net population. So most of the clients seen in these clinics are uninsured, underinsured. Uh, many of them are on our state's general assistance program uh, that is with a federal waiver just about to become a new Medicaid population. Uh, and here in King County, which is the area around Seattle, we also serve uninsured uh, clients. We serve veterans in this model of care. Uh, we serve mothers low-income mothers uh, and older adults. Uh, so it's a safety net population served in a network of about 100 and some community health centers. Uh, I'm going to give you one example of uh, one of our clinics, and this is a clinic that uh, treats um, 
the people on the state's uh, uh, general assistance program, uninsured clients, and older adults. And you see here, this is a clinic that's seen about 2,000 clients in the last two years, and uh, the mean PHQ depression score at baseline is about a 17, so that's moderate to severe depression. Uh, we're able to follow about 90-some percent of these patients, uh, which is really interesting because in these kinds of clinics, it's often very hard to have good continuity of care. We have on average about 10 contacts with a care manager. 80-some percent of the patients have their care reviewed by one of our consulting psychiatrists. And we're seeing about uh, 50 to 55 percent of these patients with clinically significant improvement. And this is very, very encouraging because these are not research data anymore. These are now very real-world clinics with very real-world, uh, tough-to-treat populations. And we're getting fairly similar outcome findings in these clinics that we got in the original study. We have gone on to develop a, a, a sort of a, a, a four-step integrated care team-building process because as we've gone out and worked with these clinics, we realize every clinic is a little bit different. Some of them have different personnel. Some of them have different resources. Everybody has different processes. And rather than saying there's only one size fits all, we said there are some core principles that are behind impact. Uh, and uh, there are some 20-some tasks that need to be accomplished by the team that collaborates in a primary care setting. And so we, what now what we do is we engage clinics in this team building process where we start with this initial thing that's summarized on this slide here is where we just give everybody in the clinic an assessment that says, here are the 20 tasks that are involved in treating depression. Is this, in your mind, the priority task? Is this something you do now? If you don't do this, who else in the clinic does this? Uh, and it's a systematic way of trying to say, what do they do now? What is the workflow in the clinic? And what is missing? The next step in this team building process then is say, are there tasks that everybody says are important but nobody signed up for? Or are there tasks that everybody said are important and there are five or six people who are doing that? And then we kind of sort of take the next step and we say, let's build a workflow that systematically really accomplishes this. And I was able to do that measurement-based care, uh, is able to do that change when there needs uh, to, a change needs to be made. Uh, and we found that very, very helpful if you do that in a systematic way. Uh, we've also developed some uh, rough guidelines about staffing needs, uh, and it varies a lot. If you're in a clinic that essentially treats an insured, employed, relatively healthy population, only about 2% of your patients may need a depression care manager, and your caseload may be about 100 uh, for a typical care manager. Uh, and if you're, on the other hand, at the very bottom of the slide, in a, in a clinic that treats uh, homeless, unemployed, safety net patients, uh, they'll have much, much higher mental health needs. So maybe 15% of your clinic population would need a care manager. And maybe the caseload in a care manager uh, may not be quite as high because these are much, much tougher clients to engage and to keep track of. So you can adjust these a little bit based on the type of setting you're in. So uh, I'm going to summarize a little bit here. Um, if we think at this point about a really effective integrated care program, uh, it has a couple of core components. One of them is you really do uh, do effective multidisciplinary practice. Uh, I don't think there is any one specialist, primary care or mental health, who can meet all of these clients' needs. So we sort of say let's build a team that works well together, that uses what is often a limited resource, leverages a limited resource in a smart way. The other thing that I think is really important that is we have a population focus. We say there is a defined population of patients. Uh, we actually have a registry tool, and that registry helps us track who is in, who is out, who needs to be followed up. And if we don't have that, what we often sort of fall down back onto is what I would call behavioral health urgent care. If you have a behavioral health provider in a primary care setting and he or she just bats at whatever comes in the door that day. But if you do that, a lot of people come in, they go back out, they never come back in, and we lose them. So we really sort of feel very strongly that you need a registry, a tool that helps you sort of say who is in the program and how do we reach out to these people if they get lost. And then finally, I think this may be the most important thing, is this notion of measurement-based and steps care. Uh, and there is another term that's being used now in care for diabetes, uh, in care for hypertension, that's the notion of treatment to target. You have to have a very clear target. And in this case, we say 
there's lots of problems in these people's lives, but right now we're about treating depression, and we're going to measure every time the patient comes in, is this depression improving? And if it's not improving on the PHQ-9, we need to make some systematic changes. And if you do these principles, I think it can make a really, really big difference. Uh, so I'm going to, at this point, uh, hand the ball back to uh, Sophia, who's going to give it on to Rita to talk about the work they're doing at Kaiser. All right. I think I'm ready. Um, all right. So at Kaiser, as you may have heard earlier, we were one of the original impact websites, and um, we had 280 participants. I was the care manager, so I got I had the privilege and uh, really enjoyed working with this project. When this was complete, and I'll have slides to discuss these in a little more depth as we go along, but once the research was over, um, because of Jurgen's insight in um, approach to really dissemination, we continued to keep my project going here in San Diego um, through Kaiser funding that. And basically, then we took a look at what's happening. And one of the things we wanted to look at with Kaiser was um, if things could be done in a little different ways to allow a little less um, number of contacts with patients, will we still get similar results? And also adding a group into our model to see how that would affect the overall care. Um, later on, as things at Kaiser began to look more and more at depression, and Dr. Dreskin really started and you know, with a number of other people getting this depression initiative going, um, taking a look at how to take this model then into all of Southern California, Kaiser, which is really where we are at this point. So the pilot study down here in San Diego was to compare 248 clients in this adapted program with 140 of usual care patients and the intervention patients. So we really wanted to look at what was happening now versus um, under now what was becoming care as usual under an impact model in our care. So the adaptations that we made, first of all, in impact, we did work with patients 60 years old and over. So when we adapted this, we went to patients, clients 18 years and older. We did add a medical assistant to help with um, some contacts with patients and um, getting appointments set up and those kinds of things. So really kind of adding someone to assist the care manager. We also had um, the beginnings and now have a very active depression class series that's a cognitive behavioral class. So we added that as another treatment model that patients could um, add into their treatment. And then we looked at the psychiatric supervision, which um, here at that time was done primarily by telephone and looking at how well that would work for us. What we found is that actually there were fewer contacts so that when it was in the impact study, which you can see in orange, and then the post study is in blue, we did uh, lower the total number of contacts, actually quite significantly, lowered the clinic visits and lowered the phone calls. And primarily the way that we lowered these was really, and you'll see because the results were very good, not by really uh, taking away from the care, but really deciding how long did people need to be in care, where the research, we kept them for a year. Um, afterwards, we said maybe we don't have to keep them for a full year, and maybe we can put them into these uh, classes instead. And so we, we took a look at that to see how well that was working. Um, the next slide shows you that we had, um, using the standard Jurgen had talked about, the 50% drop in PHQ-9 scores, we took a look at the impact patients uh, versus the post-study patients to see if we were still having a significant drop in their PHQ-9 scores. And you can see that the results were quite similar at three months and at six months with continuing to have um, in the high 60s drop in the PHQ-9 scores. So we were finding that it was working quite well. In addition, then we did some financial look at this and took a look at what 
usual care patients were costing, and this is results, well, it's published in 2006, so it's probably 2004, 2005 um, money, so it may cost more than that now, all of those. But study as usual, and then the um, impact study, and then uh, the post-study impact went down even a little bit more, again, because we weren't um, spending as many appointment times with those patients. Then um, the dissemination began probably around six years ago here into the 13 regions at Kaiser's medical centers. And the beginning of that process, uh, the group decided to really focus on doing quite a bit of screening and uh, pick a target population. So the target population initially was primarily the CVD and diabetic patients. And after that time, we've been adding other populations and other chronic conditions. So COPD, uh, we are also uh, screening patients 60 to 75, and um, bariatric patients now have been added as well. So we went with a very strong screening component, but we also put in place people who would do the impact treatment for those patients who did screen positive for depression. And as you can see here, just some numbers about the numbers of patients screened. So that was in 2009. We did screen 64,000, over 64,000 patients. And we sent out questionnaires to many more, but these are the questionnaires that we did get back from patients. And you can also see the scores. Um, we had probably found relatively less positive scores than we were anticipating in the early uh, planning for this project, uh, but we have found considerable numbers of patients who are depressed and continue to treat them. This is um, gives you another way of looking at that. Um, the patient scoring 10 or more is actually in the blue here and shows you which patients are showing a little bit higher numbers. Um, and some of the variations could be in areas of the um, Southern California region, obviously there are differences there. It could also have to do with some of the ways we end up screening, because some areas do a little more in-reach screening, meaning they'll screen people in classes or um, other clinics where they go and other places are using a little bit more of the um, mail, mail out screening forms. Um, this is the results again from 2009, we'll have 2010 quite soon, but this is showing what percentage were in improved, and improved would mean a 50% reduction from their original PHQ-9, and remission would be people have a score between 0 and um, 4 on their PHQ-9. So we had a high remission rate and a very, very good improved rate over uh, about 65%, 66% in Im improved or remission. We had about 31% that were the same and a few patients who had gotten worse. Now, I do want to point out another thing in this uh, slide just to be aware of. These patients could have started the program any time in 2009. So some of these patients, we weren't even finished treating them. We were still working with them. So I think these showed really excellent results in the patients uh, that are being treated in this program. And I think I'm done. I will turn that over to Marty Adelman. Hello, everybody. My name is Marty Edelman. I'm the Mental Health Program Coordinator at the Council of Community Clinics, and it's a, pre a pleasure to be here today to present with Jurgen and Rita. A little bit about the Council of Community Clinics. We are an agency that supports and represents 16 federally qualified health center organizations here in San Diego, Imperial, and Riverside counties. The project that I work uh, on, the Mental Health and Primary Care Integration Project, is funded by the Mental Health Services Act. The funding goes to the County of San Diego, um, which let me say is a fairly progressive and forward-thinking county, enough so that they were uh, willing to give us the money to do this project. We in turn subcontract with several, or with actually nine clinic organizations to provide the mental health services at 16 different sites. 
the the uh, project uh, is targeted to serve individuals with serious mental illness or serious emotional disturbance who are unfunded for mental health services, um, and we're we're treating three different age groups. I mention that only because some of the age groups have been somewhat challenging. We expected many more children and youth to be uh, interested or uh, eligible for services, and that has not uh, turned out to be the case. A lot of them actually have Medi-Cal. And then we've got, uh, we've found that older adults after 65 have Medicare, so we've ended up more or less treating the older adults between 60 and 65. Um, we are using two treatment models to provide the mental health service, services, and I'll talk a little about those. Um, one is called specialty pool services because that happens to be the name of the pool that the money comes out of that pays for them. And the other model is impact. Sort of the final component of our project is the senior peer promotora program, which I'll, I'll mention briefly as well. As far as specialty pool services go, um, this is a very traditional model. Clients get one-to-one -one therapy from a mental health professional and then uh, medication management is provided by a psychiatrist. Uh, the medications are provided for up to 90 days, and then the, the thinking is that the, client, the clinics have enough time at that point to decide what medications the clients actually need and get those medications through uh, a patient assistance program. It is a short-term model in the sense that treatment's available for one year, um, and at that point the idea is that these uh, clients, if they need continued care, would be transitioned to the county uh, mental health system. We all know um, as funding gets harder and harder to find that that's uh, harder and harder to do, but that was the theory when the project was developed. Um, one, of the, one of the concerns about this particular model is we um, it does achieve co-location, but it doesn't necessarily achieve integration. The primary care providers still uh, tell us that these clients go to the behavioral health black hole and then uh, they hear little or nothing in some cases. Uh, the other model we're using to provide mental health services is the impact model, which we've heard a lot about today. In our particular model, we're providing up to 16 sessions with a uh, depression care manager and up to four visits with a primary care provider to prescribe and monitor medication. The treatment period, again, is for one year. And in this model, medications are available for up to a year. We're trying to use medications that are low in cost, not only because I'm cheap, but also because um, we, we want to think in terms of what's going to happen for these, to these folks after we're done treating them um, and try to find a medication if they need to continue on medications that they can afford uh, themselves, you know, hope, hopefully through one of the $4 programs that are available at various places. Um, we do have several consulting psychiatrists um, that are board, duly board certified psychiat psychiatrists and family practice physicians, um, and obviously well qualified to do this kind of work. We like the impact model for several reasons. It, uh, as you know, because the primary care provider is involved in prescribing the medication, it's an inherently integrated model. And the other thing is, um, it, it has its own safety net. The psychiatrist is there, and as a result, the primary care providers are much more willing to treat knowing that there's, there's a backup for them should anything go awry. Um, Jürgen's, talk, um, Jürgen's talked quite a bit about the essential elements of impact, so I won't uh, stop there. This graph shows um, the scores of, two, of 947 of our clients on the PHQ-9, and let me mention um, the, the beginning score on average for these 947 clients was 15.8. These are both adults and older adults. And by the sixth session, all every you know on average the scores were, were below 10. You see a plateau at that point afterwards. Um, scores seem to range around 9 or 10. And I think there's a couple of phenomena happening there. One is I think as people are getting better, they're they're starting to drop out of the program. And then, so we're, we're continuing to treat the people who are, are, are a little more challenging as far as getting results. Um, and kind of the net effect there is a, a flat line. Um, I'd like to be able to, to know that for sure. I, we haven't figured out a way to actually study that, but that's my thinking. One of the other things we're doing down here, which I, I really like, is we're doing a lot of training with the depression care managers on other uh, topics, the idea being to help them 
um, support the primary care providers in encouraging the clients to make the necessary behavior changes. So we're treating, uh, training them on the use of psychotropic medications. We're training them on diabetes. We're training them on chronic pain. All the idea, all, all the thinking here being that they spend uh, significantly more time with the clients than the primary care providers. They can echo the same messages that the primary care providers want delivered to the clients. They can act as another set of eyes and ears for the primary care providers um, and sort out, hopefully, confusion around some, some of the simpler questions people may have. So we feel like, you know, this, um, you know, this added knowledge is, is benefiting everybody. Um, this uh, this uh, particular picture shows you how many people we've treated in the program. Um, well, let me get rid of that. Um, so to date, we've treated over uh, 3,500 people in the project. That includes both impact and uh, specialty pool service clients. Um, we have been treating most of our clients through the specialty service pool, but over time that's been gradually changing to the point where we're at the point right now we're actually seeing seeing and treating more people using the IMPACT model. Um, briefly, the Senior Peer Promotora program uh, is an outreach and education program um, for older adults who we all know are less likely to seek services on their own um, and more likely to isolate and unfortunately more likely to commit suicide. So we have a special program where we've trained Promotoras uh, to go out into the uh, community and um, identify and engage these older adults and get them into treatment. Um, so this slide sort of uh, is our slide that kind of says we think we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Sixty, Almost 60% 60 of the clients we've uh, approved for services here had not been seen in the county's mental health system at any point prior. And we think that means that we're grabbing a, an audience or a group of people who probably would not have made um, an effort to get mental health services if we if they weren't available in the primary care setting. They may never have gotten the treatment they needed. So we think we're meeting the Department of Mental Health mandate to serve the unserved and underserved populations. Um, there's also some data here about the number of people who speak Spanish and the number of people who identify themselves as Hispanic Latinos. And in both cases, those numbers are significantly higher than the county clients. Again sort of underscoring the idea that we're identifying unserved and underserved populations. Um, so what this project has obviously done well is get the folks who may not have access services, the sort of underserved and unserved populations. What it, what it may not be doing as well, in my view, is um, may, having an impact on the morbidity disparity for those with serious mental illness. So I just want to uh, – show a couple of slides showing another project we're working on that I think is actually doing that. This project is funded by SAMHSA, and in this case, rather than putting a mental health person in a primary care setting, we're putting a, a nurse in a specialty mental health program, and the nurse care managers are then screening uh, for a couple of different physical um, illnesses. So um, this project is funded by SAMHSA. We were one of the initial 13 demonstration projects that SAMHSA funded. And the nurse care managers that are in these uh, specialty and mental health programs are screening for diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, obesity, and smoking. Um, on this slide, I, I included because I just wanted to point out that we've got a large number of people in the age group of 45 to 64 um, over half the people that we're seeing in the project are, are between 45 and 64, and I think that's a good thing because I think those are the folks that are most at risk for this uh, early mortality. Um, and then um, some quickly some results from that particular project um, showing that about a quarter of the people we're screening, uh, or more than a quarter, are um, have diabetes, more than a quarter have hypertension, uh, more than half have uh, high cholesterol. Um, and, you know, I think the hypertension and high cholesterol are interesting because those may never have been um, noticed by anybody if we hadn't screened for those. Um, over half are obese and over a third are smoking, although I think those numbers are, <laughs> the, the smoking number is a little under-reported. Uh, so I think the good thing about this project is we actually are reaching those people who are at risk for the premature and early death. Um, and uh, I'll stop there.
Well, thank you um, to Jurgen, Rita, and Marty. Those were great. Um, I'm going to urge people to go ahead and submit their questions in the Q&A box. I have a couple that I've received through the chat function that I'm going to go ahead and ask our speakers, who I'm muting all of you so you can respond. Um, the first was talking about a little bit, especially in California, the kind of siloed nature of mental health and primary care services. And so the question here was um, when communication between the mental health and the primary care side is poor or virtually non-existent, um, how is it that you can implement the AIMS model with systematic diagnosing, tracking, and step care in, in the current setting, or how do you address this? So I don't know if, Jurgen, you want to take the first cut, or? Hello? Oh. All right. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I take a stab at that. Uh, well, I, I think that for the there's you know for the common mental disorders for depression for anxiety, you really have to kind of resource the primary care clinic to to do the recognition, the case finding, and the initial treatment steps. I don't think it will work ever to just identify them and refer them out to uh, mental health. I really think you have to put the capacity in the primary care clinic to recognize the problem and launch a treatment. After you launch it, you need then uh, somebody with expertise to look at these cases with you and say, some of these folks are getting better, we're in good shape. Some of these folks are very challenging, we need to make some changes in treatment. And then a smaller number of people are really, really challenging. We just aren't able to get them better. Those are the folks who need to go to specialty mental health care. And then it's, it t requires a fair amount of work to do good coordination. In the project we've done in our state here, uh, as part of the program, each of our hundred and some community health centers has uh, identified one or two community mental health centers uh, that they partner with uh, for those really difficult patients. And when they make a handoff, you have a care manager in the, in the community health center who calls a case manager, a known case manager in the mental health center, and they try to make a good handoff. It's still sometimes challenging, but I think you need to sort of build relationships with mental health mm -hmm. providers uh, for that smaller number of patients you can't really manage well in primary care. Uh, you know, there, there are cultural differences, there are communication differences. There are lots of reasons why that doesn't work well. There's also different payment methodologies uh, in our state, the health plan that pays for this integrated care actually incentivizes the communication. That's one of the targets. So in order to get full payment for this model, you have to show that you're communicating well with your colleagues in primary care or mental health or vice versa uh, to really be able to get the full payment for this model. I would also again. say something that um, – is important, I think, within this is that usually mental health records are kept siloed away from primary care systems. And so all of our records, we're in primary care and all of our records are in primary care for anything a depression care manager does. And I think that's really essential to get that collaboration going so that it's not kept away from them. In addition, um, the care managers, but not necessarily everyone in primary care, but the care managers can look at any mental health records that might have happened with this patient too, um, even if they aren't part of the mental health um, department here. So, you know, there's a lot of paperwork communication that I think is part of this as well. I'd like to add, if I can, um, here in San Diego, and, uh, and some of this comes out of financial necessity, I'm sure, as the county struggles to figure out how to continue to treat folks with ever-reducing funds, um, the, the, the county here has been, and we've been working with them, has been working really hard to, as Jurgen was talking about, pair up some of our primary care clinics with certain specialty mental health programs, although they're part of two entirely different systems. Um, and has started developing these regional collaborative meetings to talk about some of the issues that are coming up as we, we uh, try to pair up. Um, and let me also add that, you know, some of our clinics are using the integrated health record and some aren't. Obviously, we'd, we'd like them all to do that because, as Rita was pointing out, it, it makes uh, integrated care and coordinated care much easier, but we can't convince all of them to do that. So 
Uh, so I think in San Diego we're right in the midst of what you were talking about with your question. Um, you're going to have got another question here. There are a couple of them that are on the same issue, which is kind of who is trained as a behavioral health care manager? Because um, um, we heard from an RN and a clinical nurse specialist, but it sounds like you've used other types of health care workers and professionals. Yeah, we've trained, as I said, about 4,000 people around the country in this role over the last couple years. And I would say uh, any number of professionals can do this function well in this role with the right amount of support. Uh, in the original trial, we used mostly nurses. Uh, uh, since then, we have trained a lot of clinical social workers in this role. Uh, so in our program here in Washington State, I would say the majority of the people in the behavioral health care manager role are uh, licensed clinical social workers. Uh, we have uh, worked with clinical psychologists in this role. Uh, we have worked with an organization that has used nurses and medical assistants in this role. So a lot of the, the, the relatively straightforward tasks, and I think Rita said Kaiser does some of this, you know, our medical assistants can be trained to do assessments, uh, to reach out to the patient and do a PHQ-9, uh, and they may then have to pass on for some of the more complex tasks uh, to a nurse or to, a, uh, you know, a clinical social worker uh, or a psychologist. Uh, I think the most important thing is, and this is why I'm very much a fan of this systematic team-building process, to say what are all the tasks that need to get done? Who do we have in the clinic who is already able to do some of these things now and what's missing? And that's exercise and leads you to, in my clinic, who is the most logical person to do this? Uh, it's not always the same answer. Also, it depends a little bit on your population. If you're serving a, a more chronically medically ill older population and patients have lots of issues with diabetes and heart disease and, uh, and, so, and so on, you may be better off with somebody like a nurse who is very comfortable talking about all these medical things. If you're in a clinic that treats safety net populations, that are younger and maybe not as medically ill but have lots and lots of challenges coming at them in life, a clinical social worker may have a good skill set for that. Nobody has the perfect skill set, and you can train a number of different disciplines to be effective in that role. The most important thing is to sort of say what works best for my clinic. Um, that's my kind of a long-winded answer, but there isn't any simple answer to that. Yeah, if I could just add, we're using uh, master's level clinicians um, in in all the various disciplines, um, social work, MFT, interns, clinical psychology interns, and it's it's not the training as much, uh, or not their formal school training as much as their sort of willingness to work in this environment that's sort of key, I think. I, right, I can tell you who is not a great fit for this role. Uh, so... You don't want necessarily the person who sort of got trained and has their primary identity as a one-on-one -on -one long-term psychotherapist. A really good therapist is frustrated in this role because this is work that's very dynamic. There are lots of brief contacts. You have to be able to and comfortable talking about medications, about behavioral activation, about problem solving. You have to be able to interact with primary care providers. It's a very interactive you have to be willing to be interrupted. Uh, so the person who has an identity of they're going to go in an office with a client and close the door and sit by a, in a nice chair with a lamp and a fern and have a nice 45-minute session, that person easily gets frustrated in this role. Uh, I'm not saying they couldn't do it, but if you have somebody in your clinic who is a wonderful therapist and you make them do this job, it's not always a great fit. Well, I want to thank all of our speakers and be mindful of the time. Um, and I also want to remind folks that the slides from the call as well as the recording will be posted on our website. Um, what I am going to do, because there are still a number of questions in the Q&A box that weren't answered, is I'm actually going to um, pull those out of the box and we'll create a little uh, Word document with some short answer responses from Jurgen and our other speakers, which I'm asking you guys to do. Um, and I want to thank everyone for, um, for your participation. And a reminder that our next call will be on the next fourth Wednesday of the month, which I think is March 23rd, mm -hmm. but don't quote me. 
and uh, at the same time, 12.30 Pacific time, and we will be hearing from the San Mateo Medical Center and their challenges and successes in trying to transform primary care in their system. So thank you, everyone. It's a great call. Thank you. Thank Bye-bye. you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks.